Hey guys, it's Joe with PocketNow.com. Today we're going to talk about something that we don't talk about a lot here at PocketNow, and that's tablets. More specifically, honeycomb on tablets. Let's go take a look. So this is going to be more of an editorial, and because I don't just want to show you, you know, my hands pointing at things on a screen with not a lot of action, I'm going to do a little bit of talking up front so we can kind of dig right into the topic. That topic is Honeycomb. Now Honeycomb is Android version 3.x and it only came out for tablets. I don't know of any smartphones that ran Honeycomb. There's kind of a reason for that. Honeycomb needed a bit more processing power than a lot of the smartphones of the day had. Not that they couldn't have, but there weren't an awful lot already out there that could handle some of the stuff. Now that stuff primarily is a GPU, and not just a lightweight one, but kind of a, a heavy, can do an awful lot of cool stuff GPU. Now, a lot of phones had GPUs in them before, they just weren't all that powerful, and Android didn't really utilize the GPU. You had to write games specifically for the GPU in whatever phone, and since there are lots of different platforms out there, you had to write custom code to tie into the, G or the uh, APIs for all those different GPUs. It was a pain in the neck, and of course, that made app writers not really want to write games for Android, because there really wasn't any one unified way to talk to that graphics processing part. So it kind of just sat there underused. Well, Honeycomb came along and it changed all that. Honeycomb was the OS for tablets. And it was really kind of pushed out, my personal opinion here, but it was pushed out by Google to compete against the tablets that were coming out from Apple. You know, the, the iPad, the iPad 2 and whatnot. And Google was really missing the boat. They had to do something to stay in the game, otherwise they weren't going to be able to keep up. So Honeycomb came along and it enabled developers to use the GPU using basically Android APIs. Very cool, very nice. You could use one set of code for your game, for your app, whatever, and talk to the operating system, which would then accelerate it. And all you had to do was custom code a little teeny bit, really one or two lines to say, hey, use GPU acceleration if it exists, and your app was GPU accelerated. It was great. It was fabulous. did a lot of cool things. So that having been said, they had it turned off by default, and I don't know why. Not only that, but the, the OS itself, the launcher, and all the apps that come from Google weren't really GPU accelerated, so it was kind of laggy, and it was kind of slow, and it had hesitations, and it had bumps, and it really wasn't a pleasant experience. Now, it was a lot nicer, again, my personal opinion, than, say, gingerbread on a tablet, and no qualms against Samsung. Hey, Samsung did a great job coming out with the original tab and making gingerbread run on it. Wow, that, that's impressive. But still, the operating system wasn't built for tablets. It wasn't built for that extra screen real estate and doing all the extra things that you expect a tablet to do. Because really, a tablet is just a small laptop without a keyboard, right? Okay. That may be an oversimplification, but it's so much more than just a smartphone. All right, so all of that having been said, there are a couple other things that Honeycomb did. In addition to getting Google's foot in the door and getting tablet manufacturers to adopt Honeycomb rather than adopt Gingerbread and just start slapping on custom launchers and whatnot to try and make it work, and I'm going to say it, and fragment the platform even further, they pushed everyone towards Honeycomb, and Honeycomb did pretty well at doing what it was supposed to do. So what was it supposed to do? Well, let's go back just a little bit. Honeycomb also brought us what are called fragments, not to be confused with fragmentation. Fragments. Now, what a fragment is, is it's a piece of a screen. And on a smartphone, you can have a piece of a screen, say a list, an email list, that has all the emails laid out in a list for you. Great. You tap on one of those emails, or an item in the list, and it then opens up the view of that email, the body. That's another fragment. On a smartphone, you can't see both of them side by side because you don't have enough screen real estate. But the two are coupled together. It's one fragment of the same view, essentially. Think of a mirror that you drop on the floor. You have lots of different fragments. They all go together, just 
you have to look at them differently depending on if you're looking at them close up in your hand with a smartphone or kind of pushed away at more like a, a 24 inch view at arm's length like you would with a tablet. So that's what fragments were. On a tablet you can see the list on one side and you can see the contents on the other side. Really kind of cool and now we've got apps that are written to take advantage of that. A lot of the early apps didn't because it didn't exist so you had to kind of build that on your own and you had a version for smartphone, you had a version for tablet, uh, and then if you wanted Google TV, that was something else entirely. We're not even talking about that in the context of this video. So lots and lots of stuff there. But it was setting the stage. Okay, so we've got all that set down. We're going to switch over to desktop operating systems. All right, how many of you remember Windows Vista? Raise your hand. You in the back, your hands up. Okay, good. Windows Vista sucked, but Windows Vista was awesome. And I know that's opposite ends of the spectrum. What can I possibly mean? Well, if you had a computer that you were trying to upgrade with Windows Vista, it was terrible. You had all of your hardware devices that didn't work right. All of your old software didn't work right. But if you got a brand new computer with Windows, with Windows Vista on it, already pre-installed with new software, you got a new printer and new this and new that, it worked great. Not a problem at all. It was only when you were trying to couple the old stuff there that you ran into problems. Now, I come from a PC background. I built them, I troubleshot them, I sold them, I did all kinds of stuff for a local crazy guy. In fact, that's what everyone kind of calls him. You can go look that up. It, it's a whole other story, but when we did Vista, the new computers worked great as long as you had new hardware. That's where our company was different from everyone else. We used name brand hardware, not cheap stuff, but name brand, really good, high-end components went into these computers, not integrated, not all that stuff. So the drivers were there. That's where Vista was different from everything before it. To be able to grow past what Windows was, what Windows XP was and everything down underneath that, Microsoft had to reinvent the hardware abstraction, the drivers, all kinds of stuff, even the security infrastructure, especially the security infrastructure, had to be bootstrapped from the ground up and the sound subsystem alone was brand new. And that meant all of the old stuff didn't work. Well, luckily, hardware is hardware. All you have to do is have software that talks to the operating system. That's called a driver, and it works just fine, unfortunately. Some of these manufacturers would rather not write new drivers for their old hardware and instead sell you new hardware that has the new drivers that work with it. That was probably the biggest problem. Software wasn't all that big of a deal, maybe a little bit, but it was the drivers. It was the, the hardware compatibility just wasn't there. But it was a necessary evil to be able to get us past the Windows XP into Windows 7, Windows 8, which is a lot slimmer, a lot faster, a lot more compact, and a lot more able to do stuff just with current technologies. It was the old architecture that was holding Windows back. Now a lot of you are going to argue with that, and that's a lot of overgeneralizations on my part, so please, if you've got constructive comments about that, leave it down below, but realize, you know, if I said something a little bit technically simplistic, know that it was for the sake of a broader audience, okay? so. That's Windows, Windows Vista, as it compares to Windows 7 and Windows 8, which should be coming out pretty soon, and that'll be all kinds of cool with tablets, won't it? All right, but that's another video. Let's get back to Android. So, Honeycomb was a necessary evil. It had to be done to keep Google in the game, to keep, basically, Android on devices. Now, smartphones, I think they'd still be running Android if we didn't have Honeycomb. That probably true. In fact, like I said earlier, no smartphones that I know of run Honeycomb. In fact, CyanogenMod, one of the biggest custom mods out there and probably my favorite custom ROM out there, skipped right over Honeycomb entirely. And I think Google did that on purpose. They deliberately withheld the source code for Android Honeycomb from the development community until the same day that they released Android Ice Cream Sandwich. So they released version 3 and version 4 at the same time. Version 4 is a unifying operating system. It runs on not only tablets, 
but it also runs on smartphones. And we're starting to see some tablets come out with it built in. And the number of smartphones that have Ice Cream Sandwich still is kind of low. The, the Galaxy Nexus is really the flagship and it's the biggest one out there right now, but we're going to see more and more start to, to carry it new. And of course, we've got some really good uh, OEMs, you know who you are, I don't have to list you by name, that are putting Ice Cream Sandwich on their phones. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Everybody else kind of needs to too, not to mention any names, <laughs> Samsung. But please do that. Now, why is that a big deal? Now that we're coming back to one core operating system, one version, if you will, now everybody has one target to write for. Great. Apps are now writing to one unified set of APIs where you can have hardware acceleration, GPU acceleration, all that stuff, fragments. And at that point, you have one app that's built for different views, not different platforms, if that makes sense. So Google went through a lot of work rethinking and taking apart Android so that they could then put it all back together again. Honeycomb was where they did that and it caused a lot of pain. And a lot of that pain has been growing pains and, and user interface stuff and you know they, they didn't have Matthias Duarte back then. Maybe they did but he was just coming on but they didn't have a lot of his influence in the early phases. If you get the timeline down there I think I got it right. But now they've got that foundation. They went through that Windows Vista phase. It had to be done to get past that onto the next. And the next is ice cream sandwich and jelly bean and whatever's gonna come after that. But now that that foundation has been laid, now that we've had all of those pain and that struggle, we have a solid foundation to build upon. And with that solid foundation, now Android is poised to be even bigger than well, anybody else, in all honesty. But there's one. You ready for this one catch? Google TV. Now, Google TV just came out with Google TV 2.0. Awesome, great, and it's based on Honeycomb. Why? Why? Okay, it has to do with timing. They were working on Google TV 2 way back before Ice Cream Sandwich was available, so that was the next step up. And in all honesty, they've got tighter control of the hardware I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, you Google TV guys, than they do with tablets. So maybe they've got a little bit tighter control over the whole UI. Eventually, I still predict we're going to have maybe Google TV 3, or maybe they'll jump right up and call it 4 or 5 or whatever, and it will be based on Ice Cream Sandwich. So that'll be great, and we'll have one unified platform to develop for, where right now you can kind of do it. Because remember, Ice Cream Sandwich apps run on Honeycomb just fine, just fine, absolutely fine. In fact, they even run on, you guessed it, on gingerbread and the stuff below it. Just not with as many bells and whistles and finesse, if you will. So now that we've got one platform, Google's even released a style guide, a recommendation for developers on how to write apps so that you can reuse common controls that can be themed, that can be, you know, follow a common theme across the whole device, and really how to use them properly. So when the OS evolves into the next version, your app will evolve with it without any extra coding being done. That means apps are gonna look more uniform all across them, except for those who decide to break from the, the standard, not to mention any names, <laughs> ways. You know, apps that have different interfaces that are custom built for who knows why. I know why, but that's, again, beyond the scope of this video. But when we have that, now we've got three different screens to build for. We've got the handheld screen, which is viewed, you know, this close, in your hand. We've got the tablet, which is, you know, viewed a little bit further away. I look like I'm driving a car, don't I? And then you've got the TV, the 10-foot experience. It's way out there, things are bigger, but still, as long as you have those fragments, as long as you have them built right, you can then see everything on the screen in that interface and it becomes the OS that handles how that app is displayed. You don't have to, as a developer, custom code for it. Now my app that I write will work on smartphones, it'll work on tablets, it'll work on TVs across the board. That right there is Nirvana. That is what nobody else has yet. Apple has Apple TV which is based on Mac. It's not iOS. You can't have one app that runs on your phone. 
and on your iPad and on Apple TV. You've got to have at least two different apps, maybe three, depending on how you write your app to work on your, your iPhone versus your iPad. Those are getting closer together, but TV is still way out there. Great. Who's poised to change that? Microsoft. Okay, Microsoft with Windows 8. Windows 8 should run on ARM processors, so that means we're going to be able to run on tablets like we have today. That'll be interesting. But then we've got Intel coming out with their new Medfield and their Atom line, which is x86 and should run native, you know, x86 code, native Windows 8, so that'll be great. But Windows 7, if you remember, and even Windows Vista, had Media Center built into it. It had a DVR built in. I've got to assume that Windows 8 is going to do the same thing. Now, Windows 8 runs on desktop computers, runs on laptop computers, it'll run on tablets, and it runs on TVs. I've got Media Center running on my TV downstairs right now. Got it hooked into my computer by a DVI cable, and I've got a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse. I watch TV on it. I watch Netflix on it. It's right there all together. What's the difference between that and Google? Google has phones, and Microsoft doesn't. Well, they have phones, just not running the same OS. So you now have two different apps that you have to run for desktop versus, well, not mobile, but your smartphone. And if you want to write an app that works in Media Center, that's kind of different again. So writing one app that works on Microsoft TV, on Microsoft Desktop, on Microsoft Tablet, and Microsoft Phone, you've got to have multiple versions of that app. If they were able to integrate all across the board, and they're getting there with Windows 8, I believe, if they can build in the, uh, the app construction they're doing with the core Windows 8 apps and build that into the TV, they'll almost be there. We just then need to be able to do that on the phone. And Microsoft, well, they've got the monopoly again if that happens. Google is the only competitor that's close. And the only thing they're missing there is computers. Computers, they've got Chromebook, but it's... Uh, anybody want to comment with your experiences with Chromebook? It's kind of like a web browser on a laptop, and that's it. Not all that great. If it were Android on that platform, it might make a little bit more sense. But then again, it's not supposed to be Android on a netbook or on a laptop. It's supposed to be a web browser. So it's doing what it's supposed to be. It's just kind of leaving a hole there. And I think Google's taking a, a gamble on that. All right, so long and rambling, where we were, where we are, how Honeycomb was a necessary evil. I think Google had to do it. And I think Android Ice Cream Sandwich and the entire Android architecture, the, the whole environment is better for having Honeycomb, even though Honeycomb was really, really tough. Now, I'm still running Honeycomb on my Zoom. And uh, my next experiment, we'll see if there's a follow-up video to this one, will be getting Ice Cream Sandwich to run on this. So make sure you tune in and watch that. This, of course, has been an editorial and an awful lot of talking, and it's not something that we normally do, but we're interested to know if you like this format and kind of like a spoken article rather than just a long written article. If you do, make sure you give the video a big thumbs up. If you don't, give us constructive feedback and criticism in the comments down below. If this is your first time watching a video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. It's free, and that way you can keep up with all of our videos, which we cover Android, we cover iPhone, we cover Windows. If it has to do with mobile technology, we're there. Subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out. And, of course, you want to make sure that you go out and visit pocketnow.com as well so you can see the articles that we have, the news, the tips, and the solutions that we have out there as well. Make sure you do that. We love your feedback, and we want to see more of you. So get involved in the community. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, and what do you want to see more of. For Pocket Now and an editorial on why Honeycomb was a necessary evil, I'm Joe Levi.